Hi, welcome to dchurch.com. This is part three of a conversation with Dr. John Kappa talking about going beyond judgment and into a place of maturity where we welcome the other. In this ranging episode, John talks about stages of faith, the impact of thinking of God as Trinity and the nature of mystery in the Christian Christian tradition. Hope you enjoy the program. Thanks for listening. My name is Jules. Welcome. Let's think about the, the stages of faith. Could you just tease that out just a little bit more for us and, and, and what that looks like? Yeah, there's a, a couple of ways that Fowler's work, which, which comes from the 70s, has been thought through and reappropriated. He, he talked about a, a number of stages which don't necessarily develop on top of the other uh, and are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I think people often think of these things as tight compartments or a tight journey, but, but that's not, I think, how these descriptions work. Nonetheless, they often do align with ages of faith as well and have been used in the areas of child development of faith. So, for instance, I'll give you his names and, and then briefly unpack them. The intuitive projective, which means not a great deal to anyone, I think, but this is the, the sense where fantasy and reality get mixed up. Uh, this is the one where we see in uh, in an Asian country somewhere, uh, Santa Claus on a cross, you know, as a Christmas decoration, because there's not a, a clear way of separating the, uh, the mythological and the factual historical or, or the, the matters of faith and the matters of culture. And who's surprised with that? That's the Sunday school faith, if you like. But he says that, uh, especially as children get older, so we're looking at children and their stages of faith. I want to note, the challenge for us as adults is to take the demeanor of a child, which Jesus says, when it comes to our position with faith. But this is the sense when there's a, a bit more logical understanding and there's the ability to separate something from the mythical and the literal. So stage two here called the mythic literal. Then thirdly, what he calls the synthetic conventional, which is where you start being shaped by convention, where you start to grow uh, shaped by the social circle. This is where the community is really significant. Uh, this is often where there's a formal dimension. Uh, certainly in my growing up, this was Sunday school, youth fellowship, uh, and that sort of formal training within a belief system. So still assuming in some ways that everybody's Christian or that Christianity is the only center out of which we work. Nothing wrong with that. It's, it's the, the place we're in. You've got to explore your own faith before you can understand others, it seems to me. Uh, my parallel, by the way, Julian, is you can't learn to play jazz without learning to play your chords and your scales. Mm. You know, it's only after you've got the fundamentals you can then look and innovate and develop. And I think there's an element of this human progression in the way a fallacy is the stage of faith. His fourth stage he calls individuative reflective and this is the stage which is often seen in young adulthood so beyond adolescence which is still a bit exploratory but which is starting to shape people's own faith and they go well you know maybe everybody thinks and feels that but i'm not entirely sure that that works i think i need to stretch out and and take on something a bit different and this is where really tight communities will describe people who embrace this and talk about it publicly as backsliders because they're slipping back from the certainties that everybody else is either clinging to or protecting or simply uh, mouthing let's say but that's that's problematic and it can be quite a challenge to the social group uh, and and young adults are quite challenging to uh to more mature as it were groups but nonetheless those who who hold faith in that space uh, are often well equipped to continue moving on. Think about it in that many people stay in that synthetic conventional kind of space. This is what we've been given. This is the faith. This is what we accept. Don't question it too much. And, and what prompted the beyond judgment group was many who were saying that just doesn't seem to work for us. That seems to be what we see 
or feel projected as the norm. We don't think that is the norm. So those who move to what Fowler calls stage five, and then not everybody needs to. There's, there's no, you know, when you get to the gates of heaven, if that gates of heaven are a real place and that, but let's use it as a metaphor. No one's going to say, oh, you only made to stage four. Oh, dear. Sorry. Have another go. No, 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 no. This is merely descriptive. So five, what he calls conjunctive faith. And he says it's rare for people to get to this point before midlife. This is where people realise the limits of logic and start to accept that life is more comprised of paradoxes than of certainties. And they start to live with that sense of the mysterious. Uh, mysterious not in the spooky sense, but mystery in the sense of complexity, richness, wonder, uh, and in, in an odd way, a return to a childlikeness here, not childishness, but childlikeness, you know, that willingness to discover the remarkable and the wonderful and to see more symbolism in sacred stories. Uh, I think that's really powerful rather than a mere literalism in the text. So parables become richer sources of deeper truth. And then if you're happy for me to just note stage six, which I suspect at one level, is terrifying and another level is attractive depending where you are in a, in a bigger spectrum. This is what he calls universalizing faith. And this was certainly not my intention in the, the Beyond Judgment series. But what happened was many people went, actually, we can see that there are truths in other traditions, that there's a richness, there's a, an ability to, to not have to worry about defending my position but to appreciate that of others. But that doesn't mean I'm weakening my hold on faith. In fact, if anything, I may be strengthening it. So that, that's, um, for me, I think, to be fair, that is aspirational. I, I've become more of an appreciator of faith in its diverse forms. But that hasn't stopped me loving the wonder and the specialness of Christian particularities. So I'm happy to, to look at other scriptures. I, I don't understand them well. They come from other cultural contexts than that which I've been shaped in. But to have the conversations, to read the text, is to often develop greater appreciation of what I have. So Fowler, that was, that was Fowler. We got a bit excited about Fowler. It's an interesting perspective, isn't it? Particularly when you're starting to deal with, a, uh, in your own case, a, a traditional church structure like the Anglican Church, which has uh, their repeated liturgies of things that have been established as, as um, uh, not quite set, set in stone, almost set in stone, like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or, or various other aspects that are implicit in other denominational uh, liturgies. Um, whether those liturgies are written or not. Indeed, yes. Um, uh, to embrace the, the concept of mysterion in the Greek, you know, that the mystery, yeah. and not to do that enlightenment think or feel like mystery is Sherlock Holmes, I need to solve the puzzle. Yes. Just sit in the, in the, the mystery and sit in the, the wonder of it all, as you say. It's a, it's a challenging thing to do when you want to tie up all the the loose ends and threads. Yes. The, I, I, the, I love the picture of the puzzle. Uh, I, I particularly personally detest puzzles. I do admire those puzzles, though, where you can get them so easily nearly right. And then you find you've got one piece that just doesn't fit. And then you've got to go back and start again. And again, you get it nearly right, but it doesn't quite fit. I think that the designers of those are very, very clever. But there's a certain beauty in, in the elegance of their design and the fact that they confound the people who want the simple solutions. And there is a solution, 
and maybe it's exciting to find it, but I actually think there's a certain sadness in solving some of those puzzles too, actually, because the fun's now over. Now, I know that's a very simplistic example, but being willing to, to enter into that. So I think if I, if I take the formal liturgy, uh, which is both attracted and repelled people from the tradition I'm part of, if you go, oh, God, we're doing this again and again and again, without recognising the variety, the change, the different readings, different hymns, different prayers, different nuance, different focus, then it's incredibly tedious, uh, especially if it's done poorly. And it's very, very easy to do it poorly, so that's marvellous. But if we say, no, 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 there's something here that allows us to go deeper, the structure, the space is actually a way of embracing a deeper mystery, then that is a remarkable gift uh, to be able to enter into that space and to, to find God uh, in the ordinary, in the predictable, uh, in what is actually scripture compiled and you know, heaped up on itself in, in most cases and, and to open up new ways of making connections. So there's both possibilities and sometimes both at the same time. And, and your analogy of, of jazz music is a, is a sound one because in, on the one hand, you've got both structure, you've got to know how to end the, the, the bar or, or the, the end of a sequence of bars are probably more often in, in jazz. Um, yeah. uh, you can do what you like in between, but you've got to end it on a particular note or a particular chord, you know? Yes, and, yes, uh, that's really it's helpful. It's free but also formed as well. It sounds very... Uh, Trinitarian, uh, would you would you agree? Or, or it sounds to me like it, it reflects something of the nature of, of the Trinitarian God. If you to go back to Christian doctrine, I think you're right. Uh, let me pick up your comment about the creeds, and then pick up the Trinity, and then okay. a story. I think that's where we're going. The creeds themselves are, you know, useful historical documents from their time and we continue to use them because they continue to contain some essences that hold us in a, a good pattern and give us some good anchors but anchors can stop you moving if you have the chain too short uh, and i think the the aim is to have the chain long enough that you go actually the creeds don't say much about mission they don't say anything at all about loving your neighbor Jesus would be mystified by them because they were constructed to help Christianity understand itself in a time, and they're still useful up to a point. What they say about the Trinity is structuralist, if I can put it that way, not relational. Yes. It, it, it says very little about our inclusion into the life and work of God. Mm. Uh, it's, it's all seen as what God does. That's where the creeds are coming from. Now, ultimately, to be Trinitarian is then to be included into that a dynamic movement of the three persons of, of the Trinity and to ask what it means to worship a God who is a God of love uh, and who's drawn us into a certain freedom. And that's, I think, one of the marvellous things about the Trinity. Here is God who is fully free, who draws us into life, and we find a remarkable freedom uh, by giving up our own autonomy and by accepting certain constraints. So. I think that's pretty exciting. And I promise you a tiny story. I can't get over how many students who have endured studying the Trinity with me, who've come back to me years later saying, oh, I'm now worshiping in an Anglican church. And I go, was I not a sufficient object lesson? What did I fail to do? <laughs> have a joke, you know? And I say, no, John, part of the reason is you guys understand and live the Trinity. And my comment would be, no, I don't think that you can, paint us all with that brush because I know there are places where that's not entirely true. We are so obsessed with Jesus or the spirit or the father that you know, the other two become what well, like the hydrogen atoms on the oxygen atom in a, in a water molecule. If I can use that metaphor, you know, we've got one big one, two little ones, right? No, 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 no. The, the three, the three it's different. Uh, but there is something about the liturgy that is deeply Trinitarian and it's not just the recitation of, uh, you know, uh, worshiping God, the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, which is said so regularly. Um, but there, there is a deepness to it. But we've got to embrace it. We've got to see it. We've got to live it. Uh, and I think it's the living it that's a constant challenge. Yes, indeed. I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very struck by the, 
the example of Jesus, who, who didn't say very often, I don't think he ever said it, this is the truth, more, but he did say, I am the truth. And yes. if you try and pin down anyone uh, to, set, to, def, to be self-defining in that way as truth, that's not a very good way to put it, but, you know, it's kind of a more living thing. It's not a sentence. It's a person. You cannot define me by one phrase or, or piece of logic because I, I am I am I'm both Julian, but I'm I'm also um, a living being that that's, that changes from day to day and has flexibility and, and so there's there's a, a fundamental difference that that I find I'm bumping across against in terms of worldview, enlightenment worldview, which wants to define Jesus in certain ways and, and lock him down, uh, which is harder to do than people realize. I, I think you're absolutely onto something there. I mean, when Jesus talks about the truth, I mean, he's truly, truly, I say to you, amen, amen. Right? So that the word we use to end our prayers to say truly and in, in faith, he uses to start his proclamations. It's quite, quite stunning, really. And, and so the, the one, most of his truly, truly, you know, I say to you, or I am, uh, they are single images, the bread of life, etc. But when he calls himself the truth, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I think that the issue with Jesus is he's not trying to say the truth. He's trying to say things truthfully. And so truth becomes a, an attribute of what he says rather than some absolute essence of what he says. So I don't doubt that what he says is absolutely true. Hmm. It, it's the way he says that. I mean, Mark is truly my friend. What does that mean? Does it mean I have a friend called Mark? Well, yes, I do. But is he a true friend? Ah, that's what matters. Yes. And so if we think of truth relationally, and if we think of it dynamically, and if we think of it in that sense, adjectivally, rather than in some substantive sense that it's, it's an essence, it's something that has to be defended, I think humanly that, that does help us. So how do we go from that space of, uh, because we are made, made in the image of God and meant to reflect the nature of God, how do we go from that space into this space of, inclusion or welcome of others and and beyond judgment and where, where do you where did you take the course on from from that first session into some of those discipling kind of traits one of the things that i find challenging in the image of god language Jules, is that we've got many people who want to appropriate it to themselves as individuals and certainly its origin in in Genesis seems to be that God creates them, male and female, he created them in the image of God, he created it's always inclusive and so it seems to me that there's something more to the image of God than just me Now I am an image bearer, yes but more importantly, we together are image bearers, mm. so as, as community as church, whether gathered or distributed we carry the image of God in our humanness, but in our recreated humanness as well, in our, in our redeemed nature. So I, I, I want to move from that to say part of the nature of inclusion is to recognise the image of God in others and to recognise that we will be a, a better reflector of the image of God if we recognise that and if we can embrace that in some way. And potentially so will they be better reflectors of the image of God. So, so our mission is often to help people become who they are not to become something different, uh, as, as Bart put it. So the mission of the church is to go out and find where God is working. We don't take God to the world. God's already in the world. But to find where God is at work and to cooperate in the lives of individuals and communities is the essence of mission, it seems to me. Thanks for listening to our third episode with John Kappa. Next time we'll be talking with him again a little bit more about what it means to move beyond judgment. Please subscribe to our podcast, dchurch.com, or if you'd like to watch some of these podcasts on video, you can subscribe at Julian Holdsworth on YouTube. We'd also love you to join our dechurched Facebook community. So please go to Facebook for that and, 
we'd love to get to know you a little bit more. Thanks for listening.